one of the most charismatic players in the history of the game, Gardner Putnam Gar Malloy, with his striking looks, graced the world of tennis, culture, and artistry. In singles, he reached a career high of number one in the USA and a world rank of number six. He captured 46 tour titles. In doubles, he was ranked number one in the world, having won five U.S. Championship doubles titles. In addition to the tour championships, Bolloy won 127 national and 25 international championships over his 75 years of playing competitive tennis. What an honor it is for me to be here with our favorite 100-year-old tennis player, Gardner Malloy. I, I want to catch up all the audience about what you were like when you were a young boy, when you were a middle-aged boy, and how life is now. So, when you were a young boy, you didn't play tennis until you were 11, but age 10, your father, Robin, and your two uncles built a clay tennis court. Yeah, in the backyard. In the backyard. That was your first introduction. What was your first opinion of tennis back then, Gardner? Well, I didn't like it for the simple reason that my father and my uncle used to bring me out in the court and play. And uh, they were so much better than I was that... Uh, that must I, have been I, humbling for the great Gardner Merlot. I was unhappy. So... I played a little bit, and by the time I got to be 12, I, I could beat the hell out of them, so I didn't like the game. So, Why, no challenge? No challenge, you know. And they would always have me fill in their Sunday morning doubles matches and so forth, and I was uncomfortable. So I started playing over Henderson Park, which is just across the river, and uh, there was a lot of competition, and. Uh, and when I got to be 11 and 12, I could beat all those guys, so I had a lot of fun. I bet you did. You were a football player, I understand. High school football, college football, you could punt the ball 60 yards? Yes. What turned you on about football, Gardner? Oh, I don't know. I think every kid likes football. I like the contact and so forth. And. Uh, uh, I never was first string anywhere, but because I was so skinny that uh, still are. But I was a hell of a good passer, mm. and uh, uh, at, at the University of Miami, I was sitting on the bench, and once in a while, I'd, the coach would run me in to throw a pass, and uh, the opposition, the other college team, says, "Well, here comes that skinny tennis player." <laughs> Shortly after that, my father came out and yanked me off the squad. And, really? Yeah, well, uh, he said, you're not a football player, you're, you're a tennis player. So he tried to talk the University of Miami's president into uh, giving him a tennis scholarship the next spring. But there was no tennis team. He actually helped start the tennis team, and they didn't have a coach. So he was named the very first coach of the first team in tennis at the University of Miami. He was a playing coach. But of course, University of Miami in tennis then went on to become one of the great programs in history. And Gardner was able to help recruit the famous Pancho Segura to come to the University of Miami to play on their tennis team. And Pancho won three collegiate national championships while at the University of Miami in the 1940s, put their program on the national map. And that was, of course, also thanks to Gardner. You know, as a kid, I would watch you play. Later in life, you watched me play, but uh, I didn't give you the thrill that you gave me. You were a great player. You were a great-looking guy. Now, today, there are a lot of opportunities in the game, in marketing and TV exposure, et cetera, et cetera. Would you like to have played today or when you played 40, 60 years ago? Would you trade off for that? Well, I don't know. That's a hard question. That's we, why I gave it to you. We uh, we're, had more 
uh, companionship in my day. Everybody liked everybody. Today, nobody speaks to each other. And all it is is money and, and prestige and so forth. In our day, we hated each other on the court, but off the court, we were all buddies. He once said, you know, often said that um, I was the best partner he ever had. <laughs> of course, he's had Budge Patty and Billy Talbert, and you go on and on. And I told him, I said, I'll bet you say that to all the girls. <laughs> yeah. If he were, say, in his 30s or 40s now and still playing, yes, I think he'd be a, a huge celebrity because uh, of the good looks of the fact that uh, he did enjoy talking to the media, made himself available. I'm sure he would have had lots of endorsements, would have had a good career as a commentator. He'd be controversial because he loved to say it as it is. And um, we all know that he was a, a fabulous doubles player, good singles player, but not as good as he was in doubles. He, he and Bill Talbert won the U.S. championships four times. He was a winner at Wimbledon one year in doubles. I think he was in his 40s when he did that. I, but he's a, he has been remarkable. And he's, he played in all the age groups up in the 80s and early 90s, as far as I can remember, and wins all those gold tennis balls. He's won more than 120 gold balls. And you get a gold ball for winning the U.S. national championship. And he's won more than any other male player, which means he's probably got enough gold to fill up the entire room at Fort Knox. There's nobody even close to him on that. And remember, he played against Bill Tobin, which I just find fascinating. So in terms of contribution, I think primarily his longevity, his, uh, you know, his, his record of, uh, of, of, his, of his play. We played uh, mixed doubles. They used to have some tournaments in, in Florida during the winter, which we won. You know, he let me uh, take my shots. He, he didn't push me out of the way, you know? I think one thing that everybody can learn from is, you know, how well he took care of himself and, you know, reaching his birthday at, at, at 100 years old just clearly shows you when they say tennis is sport for a lifetime. Uh, I think you got to say Gar is the of that. I think in his mind found a formula for uh, living a very long and uh, happy life, and tennis was the, the big part of that. Well, my memories of Gar Malloy are extremely fond, and they actually go back to the late 1940s and the early 1950s, uh, when our tennis team would go down to Florida and, and practice uh, over the spring vacation. Uh, Gar Malloy, without question, aside from being a sensational tennis player, doubles particularly, uh, was also probably the most dashingly handsome man uh, I had ever seen. And uh, at that time, uh, I was a late teenager, early 20s, uh, had a couple of girlfriends from time to time down in Florida, but I made a point of not visiting Gar with the girls because they take one look at him and I'd lost my date. Uh, I met Gar back in 1958 when I was afforded the opportunity to play uh, in Europe and the first tournament was at Monte Carlo. I was able to get in the tournament because of him. I, I, something I'd never forget. I've played him at least three times I think and, and uh, the last time we went three sets, and he was 17 years older than me, and he still beat me in three sets on a hard court. He told this joke, which I don't remember all of it, but the punchline was that tennis umpires never go to heaven. <laughs> yeah, besides teaching me tennis, uh, I learned a lot from him, how to get along with people and being in the business. Well, he even taught me how to string a racket, how to teach a gardener defeated Frank Froelen, who was then number one in the United States, and Gardner was probably 47 years old, and it was quite an age difference, and that was very impressive. In 1960, you wrote an autobiography, 
the will to win, which yeah. you've always had. Uh, three years ago, I wrote another book, as it was. As it was. Yeah. And Billie Jean King did the intro for that. Yeah. What did Billie Jean King mean to the game? What did she mean to Gardner Malloy as a good friend? Well, nothing wrong with being a good friend. No, uh, and uh, uh, she, she spoke her piece, and uh, she and Marta, Maratilova were the two. Tina Navratilova, yes. Are the two that would speak out against the hierarchy and the uh, uh, USLTA and so forth and so on. And uh, I loved her for that, and Martina the same, because I always had a fight with this association. They, all my tennis career, they tried to have me suspended. And Why? Why? They, Why? For accepting money under the table, so to speak. Sub rosa, as the attorneys would say, under the table? Yeah, under the table which all the players, all the better players were doing. And uh, they, they, of course. Uh, and they, see, we were called tennis bums because we were living off the tennis illegally according to the rules. And uh, so what did I say? We were called tennis bums, but the players of the day are heroes, and they're playing for money. And if yes. we and we weren't supposed to play for money, if we played for money, we were bums. Get the picture? I do. I don't like the picture. You didn't like the picture. No. At Wimbledon, you may have committed a royalty ticket faux pas. Would you forget to get tickets for the Queen of England? Oh. Uh, I see you like talking about that even today. One of the ladies would have a party, and she had in her castle, so to speak, her abode. So I was on one side, and Dick Simon was on the other side, side next to her. I said, why is it we never see you at Wimbledon? Everybody goes, King Gustav, and presidents, and monarchs, and celebrities and so forth come, but we've never seen you there. Why is that? And uh, she said, my dear Mr. Malloy, you must recognize the fact that Her Majesty has so much to do, she can't possibly do everything. And I said, being a, a half-ass American, I said, <laughs> oh, Your Majesty, I thought, uh, thought maybe you weren't able to get tickets. And I, I'd be happy to get, get them for you. So anyway, uh, two years later, she was queen. And uh, uh, Budge Patty and I won the, won the doubles. And she was there for the first time in history of her being at Wimbledon. So she came down on the course. They were, I said to her, uh, Your Majesty, it's certainly a privilege and honor to receive this from you, uh, but you probably don't remember me. She says, Mr. Malloy, I remember you very well. As a matter of fact, I had difficulty getting in today because you forgot to leave me tickets. Oh. <laughs> so she has a sense of humor. <laughs> She got the last winning shot on you, Gardner. Yeah. Arthur Ashe, you've experienced some uh, challenges with Arthur. You're playing in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, there was some segregation that was Oh, being yeah, yeah. He shows up, and we're in the registering office, and they were signing us different cottages, the players. So I went in there, got in there, and said, why can't he have a cottage? Oh, it's restricted. He's black. I said, if he's restricted and can't stay here, I'm leaving. I said, what do you mean you're leaving? You're seated two. He's seated one. The seated one player can't have a cottage, but the seated two can. I said, well, this, this, you know, this is the South. 
I've seen it too, and I got a cottage, and the seated number one player has to go on the other side of town in Blacktown. Either he gets a cottage or I'm leaving. And they gave him a cottage. Good for you. Good for you, Gordon. Well, it wasn't right. That no, was right, but you made it right. Yeah. Talking about a very brash, kind of a bold move. You, Eddie Herr, Ed Turville, all of a sudden you decide we're moving Florida out of the Southern Tennis Association into its own Florida. How bold of a move was that? South Florida had more votes than the rest of the section, which covers a number of states. And we outvoted them. We voted to become a... Independent. Yeah. And, uh, oh, it was all, all hell was it. You can't do that. You got to do this, you got to do that. And we just statically said, let's have a vote. Let's have a vote. And we took with us, every club had a vote. And we took all our clubs, and they had more clubs than we did over several states. But they didn't know, a lot of them didn't show up. And uh, so we got every one of them, and we outvoted them, and became a, a Florida association. One of the young guys were talking about Brian Gottfried, who was so proud to be on your team tennis out of Miami, where you would play other teams on Sundays. You let him sub now and then. So when I asked him what his proudest moment was, he said playing for Gardner Malloy's team, and he'll never be able to thank you enough for that. Oh. What was that team like? What That was a big thing back then, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. They don't have it anymore. Or they do it in a smaller way. Uh, our team was Henderson Park, and uh, we, we had six singles and three doubles, and we'd play a different club or hotel or whatever. Uh, Gardner was a, a great inspiration to all Floridians that played tennis, uh, particularly in South Florida. Uh, we used to have these um, team matches between clubs back in the 60s. And back then, Miami had a very, very strong, very, very high level of men's tennis. And if you were even allowed to play one of those, you know, you were pretty good. And sometimes as a, as a 12 or 13 year old, they put me in at number three doubles. So I'd get an opportunity to see some of the top players, not only in the city, but these guys were some of the top in the country. And certainly Gardner was one of those. He had a huge forehand back in the days before players developed big forehands. But it just meant a lot to the game, was always around. His passion for the game, uh, he played it I guess in, just until recently, uh, so well into his 90s. Uh, great competitor, and, and he not only, unfortunately for Gardner, pro tennis really wasn't at the level it is now or near it. He played all the major tournaments in the world as an amateur, so his reputation was made through those as an amateur, through Davis Cup, and he played at the highest level. He just wasn't called a pro, I don't believe, but he played, you know, you, you would compare him to anybody that's playing nowadays in, in what he's accomplished. Your proudest time in your life, I know, was serving our country as a naval officer. How proud of a time in your life was that? What did that mean to you, Gardner? Well, it was an exciting time, and uh, I enjoyed every minute of it, even though it was brutal. A bunch of uh, admirals and whatever showed up and they were making speeches and they were saying how great it's going to be you all you guys are going you're going to face the enemy and you're going to shoot this and everybody was going like this and then these admirals and high mucky mucks said oh well you get in these landing boats and you hit the enemy territory and you hit the beach and you know and you charge them and and, I, and we were thinking and they, they'll be shooting at you, and you'll be heroes, and this, that, and the other. And, and everybody was dying. And uh, so I had the duty that night. So I get back, and I get on the loudspeaker to, to the rooms that were assigned to us. And I said, 
Hooray, we're all going to amphibious. I wonder how many of us will be living this time next year. And then oh, I heard shouts all through the oh, That goodness. son of a bitch Malloy, he's <laughs> at it again. Some great times, some great stories with the Navy. Yeah. Your best friend, Davis Cup captain, Bill Talbert. The two of you went on and won numerous slams together. Talk about that relationship between you and Bill Talbert. Well, our relationship was, uh, I don't say a difficult one, but a strange one because here we lived together, played tennis together, won championships together, played Davis Cup together, and uh, he was out every night. I was in, and uh, we were down in Cuba playing a tournament, and we were at a party, and Bill was drinking, and uh, none of us were, and uh, so Bill says, you know, I, I brought up the side, how in the hell can you drink and play? So uh, you can, anybody can do it. So the next day, the three of us couldn't hit a ball, and Talbert was chippy as a lark, and he won the following day in the finals. In 1972, you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. Was there a ceremony for you that day? No. No, Good. I, I was in Miami. I was just notified. Well, I was, how, what did that letter make you feel like? Made me feel great, of course. Bitsy Grant and I were the two players that went in. Went through the ceremony. And I was next to Bitsy Grant. And a little differential was, uh, there. I'm, I remember Bitsy. Yeah. I was two blocks higher than he was. We have a great friend of, of the sport of tennis, a true legend of the game. In 1952, he was the number one player in the United States. He was a finalist at the U.S. Nationals in singles. With his partner, Billy Talbert, this legend won four U.S. National men's doubles titles. Please welcome the 1972 enshrinee into the International Tennis Hall of Fame, Gardner Malloy. Well, it had to be a, a very glorious day for you yeah, to uh, yeah. achieve that, certainly. You were uh, married to Madeline for 56 years. What impact did she have on your life? Well, we were college sweethearts and uh, she's the mother of my children, my two girls. When I was a teenager, we grew up in this lovely house with my mother and father. We had a tennis court in the backyard, a red clay tennis court. And after years of begging my father to come outside and hit with me, he did one day and he served it to me as hard as he could. I covered my eyes and held out my racket the ball hit my racket and it bounced back over the net short and he couldn't get to it and he threw his racket down and walked off the court and never got out there with me again. Now you're married to Lady Jacqueline, to Jackie. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. And My wife passed away you know, maybe 30 years ago or more and, and he remarried when he was 95, which is a Gardner Malloy trait, which is marvelous. I had breakfast with Vic one day and uh, we got to talking about Gar. Gar and uh, he had just gotten married and Vic sent him a note, congratulations on your marriage. Did you have to? <laughs> it was, it blew me away. She's in line for the throne. A little removed, but still in line. Yeah. Does that mean that uh, you're, you're in line for the throne also? She is in line to become queen. Yes. It's a pretty long line and, you know, and so forth. If she becomes queen, that makes me king. Yeah, of course it would. <laughs> you can handle that. You're ready for that. Yeah. Gardner Malloy is just a great inspiration to tennis. And, uh, I mean, he's won at all levels. He's conducted himself as a gentleman. And all I can say is nothing but great things. And, again, happy birthday, Gardner Malloy. And I wish him a 
happy, happy birthday on the occasion of his 100th birthday. Happy birthday, Gardner. It's my great pleasure to wish Gardner Malloy happy birthday. Happy birthday, Gardner. A hundred years. Wow, what a mile mark. But anyway, you are such an inspiration. I love your attitude. I only hope that I can be as fortunate as you with have that attitude. All the best. Gardner Malloy, it's so nice to be in the same room with you. And please, sir, remember that when you're 113, I'll be 100. Happy birthday. Gardner, congratulations on your award and wishing you a very happy birthday and cheers to many more to come.